We started a new series last week called God's Most Wanted. And we're taking a look at specific things that Scripture says, God says, or others say, or by his actions, God demonstrated what he wants from us. And it's a whole lot easier to live in obedience to God if we know what he wants. Can somebody say amen? And so if we know that God wants something, uh, then we're in a unique position to align ourselves with that. The passage that Breck was referencing this morning uh, during our offering time and that time of ministry right there in John 17 is the only place in Scripture where we can answer, where we can be an answer to the prayer that Jesus prayed. And Jesus prayed that we would be one even as he and the Father are one and the Holy Spirit within them. We are the only ones who can be the answer to that prayer. We can pray the prayer, but more than that, we can be the answer to the prayer we pray when we not only come together in unity, but then we begin to live that out as a lifestyle in community. Community is made up of two words, the word common and the word unity, a common unity. And so one of the two sacraments or sacred things that Jesus uh, instituted for us or prescribed for us, one of them was communion when he gave instruction uh, not only to his disciples, but Paul would later say that he passed on to those in the Corinthian church what he himself had received from the Lord directly from him, a firsthand revelation and instruction. And then he instructed them on how to receive the Lord's Supper and to do so not only properly, but in a way that really honored the Lord, because what they were doing was a far cry from it. And so when we understand God's heart and what he wants, we can align ourselves with that, and it's a powerful thing. So this morning, we're going to talk about the fact that God wants unity, but he wants unity in his church and among us expressed through relationships called community. Where Christ is the center, he is the focus. It's not that we all look the same. God doesn't want us to have uniformity. God wants us to have unity. Uniformity is when we could say we're all gathered together in the same place at the same time. But that doesn't bring us together as one. Doesn't mean we think alike, we don't talk alike, we don't look alike, we don't dress alike. Even if we had a dress code and it was very strict and men have to dress like this and women have to dress like this, there's still a distinction. And so uniformity tries to whitewash the thing to where everything looks the same. It, it paints over and the, the veneer, the outside looks all the same, but that's not unity because it's what's underneath that brings us together in a real spirit of unity and brings us into a place where we can express things uh, because we're unified that are far more powerful than we ever could individually. Um, Our community has been uh, touched deeply recently by the loss of two uh, of our own police officers here, but we're not the only ones. And A couple weeks ago in my home state of Nebraska, in the city of Omaha, there was a female officer, uh, I believe her first name was Kelly, her last name was Orozco, and uh, she had been on the drug or the gang uh, task force and been an officer there and served honorably, was well respected, and uh, she'd actually, uh, her and her husband, uh, they had become pregnant and she had her baby and she went back on uh, shift a couple weeks ago on a Friday night, uh, her last shift before she was going to take maternity leave. And that night encountered uh, a situation where uh, a gang, uh, ex gang member uh, who had a long uh, criminal record uh, fired at her and shot her and killed her there on the street. So the community was just as devastated, obviously, as we are. And, uh, but to complicate the matters, as her the, the time for that, her baby was still in ICU, and so it, it just added a whole different dynamic to that. And then the community got word that the, um, the I hate to say members, the people from Westboro Baptist Church uh, would make me want to announce being a Baptist forever. Um, th- they're the group, the hate group that goes around the country masquerading uh, as a church and uh, uh, spewing hate and 
whatever to various groups that they choose. And basically what they do is just for publicity. And so they decided for whatever reason, they were going to picket uh, Officer Roscoe's funeral procession there in Omaha. And uh, being a Nebraska boy, uh, let's just say that doesn't work real well. And so uh, they, there was this incredible scene where the, the community did not respond with violence, but there's a group of uh, motorcycle riders that are all ex-military that travel around to military funerals and whatever just to, to be a barrier between the Westboro Baptist people and whatever, the funeral procession that is there. And they picket military funerals and whatever. It's really warped deal. But it's, it's based in hate and, and self-centeredness rather than anything to have to do with God or church. And uh, so not only did the, I think they call themselves Freedom Riders uh, or their patriot, something. Anyway, they, they gathered and the community then found out about it. And so they sent out a deal. They made a Facebook post and, and harnessed social media and said, um, we would like to come together in unity as citizens and take a stand between the Westboro Baptist people and the funeral procession as it comes by. So what we'd like is for as many people as can to gather, and they found out the location where the Westboro Baptist people were gonna gather, and there's an overpass where Interstate 480 comes through downtown Omaha, and the funeral procession was gonna go under the underpass, and so the Westboro Baptist people were gonna gather on the side of that overpass and hold up their signs that were vulgar and hate-filled and, and very uh, just stupid. So um, the, the citizens gathered more than a 1,000 uh, Omaha people. I'm a Nebraska boy. I'm proud of my home folks. They gathered, but they gathered not with signs, but with white bed sheets with a blue stripe painted across the center of them. And what they did was just quietly gather, and as Westboro Baptist people were screaming at them and yelling all kind of expletives and whatever and curses on them, they just quietly walked down uh, the side of the, the inner uh, overpass there where they had gathered, and over a thousand people raised up their bed sheets together with a blue stripe across the center of it, and you couldn't even see the signs for the people from Westboro Baptist that had gathered there to, to try to picket the deal. So they just got frustrated and quietly walked off. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Now, I would have liked to follow them and, and laid hands on them, so to speak. That, that's just me. Aren't you glad I'm not God? And so that, that it's just that whole action. What, what really moved me was how powerful a simple expression of unity could be. That it wasn't individuals taking matters into their own hands and, and challenging them or whatever. It was a community coming together with one idea, with one purpose, a very simple plan, and saying, if you wanna do this, we're not gonna retaliate, we're not gonna say anything, you, you, you don't have to show force at all. What we're gonna show is unity, and we're gonna show that we can create a, a thin blue line between hate and expressing honor for a, an officer who served and, and to pray for her family. And so it was incredible, the pictures that went really worldwide. And at first you don't understand what it is. It, it looks more like a, a demonstration in Israel, you know, because the Israeli flag is, has the blue stripes with the star. And so here were people standing behind these sheets holding it up, and as a funeral procession came by, they didn't even know the Westboro Baptist people were there because they couldn't see them, they didn't hear them. All they saw were over a 1,000 people making a line that, that they passed through under, and what they expressed and saw was the honor. That's the power of unity when we come together. Now, when we take it to another level and when we come together in Christ, it's even more powerful than that. Can you say amen? And so Jesus here, um, as he taught his disciples and brought them together, one of the last things that he experienced together with them was the Last Supper, 
which become the Lord's Supper or what we call communion. And Jesus did some very specific things at that and he initiated it where he gathered them together and he began to wash their feet. He didn't start by serving them communion or the bread or, or, or the cup. He started with a towel and a basin of water and laying aside his garments and began to wash their feet. And so it's this aspect of him washing and cleansing them. And then Peter was very challenged by that and he resisted it. And he said, Lord, you, you, you won't wash my feet. You know, sometimes humility is an intimidating thing. And so Peter was struggling and Jesus said these words to him. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Later in that same meeting, he would tell them, you are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. So he, he wasn't there to cleanse their feet. He was there to begin to wash their feet so that he could cleanse their hearts and wash their souls. The scripture says that we don't live by bread alone, but we live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Uh, that was Jesus quoting all the way back in Deuteronomy where it says God caused them to hunger and then fed them so that they would know that it wasn't just their natural hunger that drove them or their natural hunger wasn't the most important thing. The spiritual hunger was that he did, they don't live on bread alone, but we live on the word of God. When Jesus instituted this sacred act of communion or the Lord's Supper, he wasn't feeding them a meal, but he was connecting it with natural hunger and, and ministering at a far deeper or spiritual level. Um, the, we sang the scripture and then was quoted as well this morning, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. Those who hunger and thirst in a natural sense are just responding to uh, our bodies that have an appetite. And when we take some bread or when we take uh, a drink, it can uh, stop that physical hunger momentarily, but it will return. But here, Jesus says, this isn't just about your physical hunger. In fact, Paul would take it to the degree that when they came together in the Corinthian church, he said, your meetings do more harm than good. And then he said, it's not the Lord's Supper that you take. Because the focus wasn't on the Lord. It wasn't about the Lord. It was on them. And they were coming together to eat. But, the, but because of their selfishness and their, the divisions that were among them, some of them would, would eat too much and others would go home hungry. That they wouldn't recognize the poor and what they had to bring or the lack thereof. And so they brought shame to them because there were divisions. And then others would, would just drink way too much of the wine and they would get drunk at the Lord's Supper while others wouldn't even get to receive. So he said, it's not even about God. It's not the Lord's Supper and, and it's doing more harm than good. It's emphasizing your divisions rather than your unity. And so here Paul gave some very simple instructions and I want us just to look at that for a moment this morning to see how practical uh, that his instruction was, but the correction that it brought to them as well. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, I just want to take a couple of minutes and, and set this up of the, the why of communion. Why, why, why do we do that? Not just what do we do, but, but why? And I want us to think about it. And Jesus gave some specific instructions that Paul passed on, and I think it's good for us to look at those this morning. Here, beginning in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the scripture says, but in the following instructions, Paul writing to the, the uh, church at Corinth here, he says, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church. And to some extent, I believe it. But of course, there must be divisions among you so that uh, you who have God's approval will be recognized. So it's this whole competition and comparison of who has God's approval. And we all have God's approval. And when we come to the foot of the cross, it's all level ground. Can you say amen? I read a story a couple weeks ago about the Duke of Wellington. And uh, in the 
as he was living there, he came into the church and uh, to receive communion. And there were divisions because he was royalty and the royalty could come and they would receive communion uh, separately. And, and this sense of hush and honor would come as the, the royalty came into their church and everybody else had to wait and they couldn't touch them and they couldn't get close to them. And they couldn't get by them. But on this occasion, the Duke of Wellington came and not only did he receive communion from the priest, but he knelt down beside the communion table and he held the elements there in his hands and he was praying and very quietly a old man came and made his way uh, down and knelt beside him and the people gasped in the church and some officials in the church came and tried to get the man to move away and let him know that that was not proper and that's not how we treat royalty and whatever and he felt a, a hand reach out and grab him and the Duke of Wellington re grabbed the man's arm and held it there and then slipped his hand in his as they prayed together. And he says, do not, he told the old man, do not leave. We're equals here. We're equals when we gather here at this table. What a powerful expression. Not only of the humility of a royalty, not realizing that he's caught up in this pride and that he's nobody special when it comes to Christ, that the focus is on who Christ is in him, not who he is before Christ. And we all receive in that common sense of the same thing, of the bread that Jesus said was no longer just natural bread, but he said, this is my body, my body, and it's broken for you. And then when he took the cup, it wasn't just the wine or the juice that they all passed around and shared commonly. Jesus said, this is my blood that brings us into a new level of covenant. And so that sense of commonness and the sense of unity is what brings us together in community as we gather around the table this morning. Paul went on to say in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 20, when you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper because that's not their focus. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing it with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What, don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly cannot praise you for this. And so then Paul goes into this place of sharing with them very practically and, and specifically what Jesus gave to him. There's three simple points here that he emphasizes. And the first is when we gather at the communion table, when we gather in unity here, as we have this morning, there are three specific things that Jesus said we were to do. And the first is the reason we gather and the reason we celebrate this together and as the Lord's Supper is to remember. Listen to these words. In verse 23, Paul says, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. All right, so this is firsthand information from the Lord Jesus to Paul, the apostle, who's now teaching and instructing the church. I received this from Christ himself. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and he said, this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. The as often wasn't a requirement uh, or a prescription that every time we gather, we have to do it. He just says, as often as you do it, whenever you come to this table, remember that it's not about you. It's not about a meal. It's not about the physical. It's not about the natural. It's profoundly spiritual. And when it's focused on Christ, it's not the kind of bread. It's not the kind of juice. It's what Jesus said, the meaning of it and the power of that meaning was when we received it by remembering him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. 
And when Jesus took common bread and he gave thanks and broke it, and then he said, this is my body, he was fulfilling the requirements of the sacrifice, which would have been broken or slain. Sometimes the sacrifice would have been cut into pieces or broken into pieces like Jesus did the bread, but the sacrifice would have been a covering for sin. It wouldn't take it away until Jesus said, it was my body that is broken for you. It wasn't just bread to meet a natural need. Now it was his body to meet our spiritual need, not only for righteousness and right standing for God, but in everything else we need. In the profound depths of healing, as we ministered this morning, those who are still waiting for an answer from God or for him to meet that need, it is here this morning. And as we gather at this table and go past the natural and what we can see or can't see or what we don't have yet or what those places in our heart where God hasn't uh, met our need that we can understand it, that we gather and we remember him and we take a simple piece of bread and connect us with the fact that it's more than just a cracker, more than just unleavened bread. That when Jesus said, as we gather in remembrance of him, we remember that Jesus made it something profoundly spiritual for us. We eat it and we taste it with our natural taste and senses. We chew it with our physical bodies. We swallow it with the mechanisms that God has made. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. But when we remember the significance that Jesus infused in it, now we engage our spirit, not just our physical bodies, in a natural way. Everybody got it? Can you say amen? All right, so we remember that is the first reason that we gather. Uh, when Jesus exhorted them to connect around those things and in him, that, that it, it takes it out of the realm in which we live. And just like Jesus came to earth from heaven in the power of the Holy Spirit, lived here for 33 years in a physical body, but continued to minister beyond the natural realms because of the Spirit of God and the anointing that was upon his life. The same thing happens when we understand that heaven wants to invade earth, just like Jesus did in a physical body. And then after Jesus defeated death by dying to death and being the sacrifice and was raised from the dead, scripture says death no longer has a hold on him. So once again, not only does heaven invade earth, but then Jesus gives us the authority in his kingdom for us to pray that, that God's kingdom would be established right here on earth just as it is in heaven. And Jesus puts the exclamation point on it. Can you say amen? In other words, Jesus was making an exchange and not just a natural one, but a physical one. Sometimes we make an exchange in life. Some of us say when we uh, exchanged the, the privileges of uh, single adulthood uh, for sharing our names as guys with our bride, that we make an exchange. And, and we have a very common way of expressing that, I married up, or I traded up with that. Y'all with me? When, when Jesus made the exchange, he traded up. And it wasn't just a little snack, it wasn't a tidbit, it wasn't just a little sip to quench our thirst, it was trading up in a great, far greater meaning. Most of us this morning are very familiar with the name of Jesus Christ, but most of us aren't familiar with the name Kyle McDonald. Some of you may be. Kyle McDonald got an idea in 2005, but he didn't have much resource. So he decided what he would do is take the only thing that he had and start with that, and it was one red paper clip. And he took a red paper clip, but he harnessed the power of social media. What he really wanted was a two bedroom house. What he had was one red paper clip. And he got an idea that if I could trade a series of trades, I'll start with my one red paper clip. And he listed it on social media. And he said, here's what I have to trade. One red paper clip. And if you'd like to trade this red paper clip, I will meet you and I will make an exchange, but I would like to trade up for, for something of greater value or significance. And, and my goal is to eventually trade for a two bedroom house. How many people think that's kind of crazy? 
How many people think he did it? How many people think it took him 10 years to do it? it? Took him less than a year. And he started with one red paper clip and in a series of 14 exchanges. 14. He traded his red paper clip for a, a ink pen in the shape of a fish. And he traded the fish for uh, something else of pretty insignificant value. And eventually he traded uh, what he had to a, a ex-marine who traded him an old beat up generator and he traded the generator for a snowmobile and he traded the snowmobile uh, for something else, eventually traded for a box truck, a, a little small moving truck, traded that for someone with, for an afternoon with Alice Cooper uh, that they wanted some celebrity auction thing and he traded that for something else, eventually traded that for a movie role, uh, a bit part in a movie role and then he traded that for somebody in Canada for a two bedroom house in the country and it's still there. And this last year he donated the house in that small town in Canada to back to the community because it's the number one tourist attraction in that entire area. He's written a book about it, and now he travels all over the world speaking to corporations about the power of an idea and starting with what you have and trading it for something else of, of value and not seeing that as an end in itself. It wasn't a direct exchange. He didn't walk into the bank and say, hi, I have one red paper clip and I'd like a two bedroom house. He didn't walk to his neighbor and say, I really like your house. Would you like to trade it for a paper clip? Because that would be crazy. But somebody who had a pen in the shape of a fish decided I'd rather have a red paper clip than this pen, or this is kind of a crazy idea, and I'll be glad to trade this pen. It may not be of much worth or value to me, and I could use a red paper clip. Maybe neither one of them had any significant value. Maybe it was more the power of the idea. And sometimes we kind of get that same approach when we come to the communion table and we don't realize why we're there. We don't understand what we're doing. Or sometimes we can do it so often that it loses its meaning or uniqueness to us. And so here, Jesus told Paul to tell them to remember. Why? Because we have a tendency to forget. And Jesus said, tell them to remember me. It's not about a red paper clip. It's about a piece of bread and a cup. And it may seem just as insignificant because the bread isn't enough to satisfy our hunger and the cup certainly isn't enough to quench our thirst. Anybody ever remember back the first time you took communion, maybe as a child or whatever, and you really didn't know what was going on, but you thought it was cool they had snacks in church. But then you thought, can, can I have seconds on that? Because that wasn't much. I mean, it's not even, you know, five goldfish. It, it's, it's just, is that all? Listen, the, the significance of that, that Jesus said, my proportions are not according to your need. They're according to the need that's already been met in heaven. That one drop of Jesus' blood was powerful for all eternity, but he shed it all. That one piece of his flesh given as a sacrifice would have been holy, but he gave it all his entire body to be crucified for us and brutalized because it wasn't just the sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sin. It was to take our shame and our sickness and our disease and every mental disorder, everything that's wrong in this world. He took it into himself and he traded up. He made an exchange and he says to us today, if you will come, in humility and exchange just this memory, this recognition that it's not about you, it's about me. That, that what I'm saying is if you'll bring your brokenness, here's my healing. I'll trade, we can trade up at the communion table. If you'll bring your sin, here's forgiveness in this cup. If you'll bring your disconnected relationships, I'll bring you into relationship with the God of the universe. He's my father and I'll make you family and we'll bring you in. If you will bring your, your sickness and disease, I'll bring the healing and we can trade up. Anybody grateful? 
that Jesus didn't start with a red paper clip. He started with some bread and a cup. But he said, listen, here's the significance of the trade. It's not about my sin, it's about your sin. And I'm trading my holiness, my righteousness, my purity for everything you need. And when we remember that, then this table is more than enough to satisfy our hunger and to satisfy our thirst for righteousness. Can you say amen? Second thing I want us to remember this morning that Jesus gave them specific instruction was not just to remember him, but then he said, actually, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Verse 26, Paul said, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing or proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Interesting. That, that the death that he died brought us life, but Jesus didn't say we were to proclaim the life. We're to receive the life, but we're to proclaim the death because that's the exchange that it took to, for us to receive life. Amen? And so when we understand that, it, it's a powerful thing. Uh, Max Licato, uh, in his books, uh, Six Hours, One Friday, I believe it was, told a story years ago uh, about a missionary who encountered a small tribe in the Amazon jungle. And they were uh, living together in this tribe, and he was trying to bring the gospel to them. But when he re- arrived at the village, there was a fever and a, a sickness that was going rampant among them, and many of the villagers were dying. And so he realized that there was a small hospital not far from there, but they'd had to cross this river to get there. And as soon as he shared with the elders of the village, listen, we can bring help and prayed for them, obviously, but then said this, we can uh, address this uh, fever and, and we can get medicine. And not only can God heal, but we can bring health to the people so that then they can really receive and, and that they can live. And they said, all we have to do is cross the river and it's a short hike down this trail. And the the elder said, no, we cannot do that. And and he said, what do you mean? It's just right across the river. And they said, that is the river of death. That that there are evil spirits that live in that water. And if we get into the water, they will kill us. And he said, no, no, there's not. I came across the river to get here to your village. And they didn't believe him. And so he went out to the side of the river and he put his hand in the river and he said, look, nothing, nothing happened. There are no evil spirits in there. There's not death in that water. In fact, there's life across there. If we go across the water, we can have life. The the village can be saved. They still refused to believe him. So he got down in the water and he waded out in the water. He began to splash the water up on himself. And then he went all the way down underneath the water and he came back up and they still refused to believe him. And so then he said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. And he plunged underneath the water and swam all the way across the river. He got up on the other side and he raised his fists in triumph and he told them that that the evil spirits didn't kill him. There's no evil spirits in the water. It is not a river of death, but if they crossed it, that they could have life and they could have healing. Then they finally made their way across. He went across, got the medicine, came back to the village and not only brought healing through the medicine, but he brought the gospel to them as well. And many of them were saved as a result of that. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. And it's exactly what we celebrated communion, that Jesus came to the earth and then plunged into the river of death. That he not only crossed the, death, the river of death for us, plunging under its surface, but rose on the other side and pumped his hand victoriously as he rose from the dead and said, now you can have life because I have swum the river of death for you. When he's telling us to remember, that's one thing And looking back, that he's our Passover, but when he tells us to proclaim his death, that's something else. That that what Jesus did for us in conquering death now means that I can have life so we can freely proclaim to others, you no longer have to die from your sickness, from your disease, from your sin, from the, the things of this world, because Jesus conquered death for you. 
You no longer have to live with it and deal with it because Jesus brought us into a place where he wants us to have life and have it more abundantly. How many are grateful that we serve a God who swum the river of death for us so that we can have life? Hallelujah. It's worth not only remembering this morning, but proclaiming. Can you say amen? Here's the last thing that I want us to get and to see this morning how powerful it is that Jesus said, not only do we remember him as we gather here, not only do we proclaim his death until he comes, but this communion table is also a time for us to come together in unity and examine ourselves and repent. Examine ourselves and repent. Verse 27, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, so anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Not sinning against God, not sinning against the Father. If we drink it in an unworthy manner, we sin against the body and the blood of the Lord specifically. Now, almost every time I've heard somebody reference this in a message, it's been with almost a condemning tone that, that you better examine every part of your life. You better clean every part of your life up. You better make sure there's no sin whatsoever. And if so, don't you come and take this because if you come and take this, it'll kill you. That, that's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying the reason we remember is that it's not about us and our gatherings. It's not about uh, us coming together for us. It's about us coming together in him because he's the one that's significant. The, the reason we proclaim his death until he comes is because that's where we're living. And without him, that's our only hope. That death is still our enemy, but God conquered all our enemies. And now death is just a transition point for the continuation of the life that God wants to have for us. It's not just life on earth, it's life eternally. And that gives us great hope, especially when we encounter all the dynamics that death brings into our lives. Come on, somebody. So here he says that that it is a time that is very serious and very uh, somber in that sense where we examine ourselves. And it goes back to what Jesus told the disciples as they gathered in that upper room to to celebrate Passover. Jesus began with a washing. And not just the literal water of washing their feet, but he was washing them with his words. He said, you're already clean because of the words that I have spoken to you. And then he gave them further instruction. If they were already clean, why did he have to wash them? Because washing is not only sanitary, washing is refreshing. Come on, somebody. Those of you that have a refreshing fragrance because someone sitting near you washed this morning, uh, or at least last night, just tell them thank you. It's, it's refreshing. Those of you who've experienced the opposite of that scenario, just don't say anything. Come on, are you with me? That, that there's a sense that God brings us to, but there's a powerful part of this in refreshing our walk with God where we come not only to have him wash our feet or one another to wash our feet, but to have him wash our souls, to have him wash our minds, to have him wash uh, the weariness out of the inside of us and the heaviness off of our hearts, to pour living water out upon us so we can realize how God wants us to walk in this area of refreshing. Foot washing was a a, a sign of hospitality in that day. Foot washing was also a sign of tremendous humility because the teacher, the Lord, the master of the house was not the one who did it, it was the servants. But yet here Jesus said, now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And then he brings him to the table and he shares the bread and he shares the cup and he walks through the process of remembering, starting with the refreshing that comes from the washing. And then that aspect of what it means to us, what it brings into our life, it's a powerful thing. Paul finished that by saying that that 
if we eat and drink in an unworthy manner, we eat and drink judgment upon ourselves. And then he said, that is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Anybody grateful for the hope like that? So Jesus brings us here to this table consistently, as often as we do it, to remember the exchange that he made, the trade that's still available to us, not just old lives for new, but death for life, brokenness for healing, that we remember that Jesus did something that no one else could do for us, but he invited us to participate. To, to partake of that. And then we proclaim his death until he comes. That we proclaim the power of what he did and the, the strength of his resurrection in our life. And then we come to this time of examination, of looking inside and washing our souls, the time where we come to him for the refreshing, but also the, the cleansing that we need. In 1818, the uh, common struggle in giving birth to children was a condition that became known as childbed fever or childbirth fever. And the mortality rate for women delivering babies was one in five. 20% died in childbirth from a fever that would come into their lives. Until one doctor named Semmelweis uh, began to practice something very simple. That the, the normal routine for doctors in that day was to start their day in the morgue uh, doing autopsies on uh, bodies, of course, that had died and uh, dissecting them. And then going from there directly to the exams of the mothers who were in labor or giving birth without washing their hands. So Semmelweis began to do a study and he realized that, that, that if you uh, inject or, or uh, come in contact with decomposed flesh in an open wound or in a place in your body where the bacteria and the infection can there, then it would begin to run rampant and uh, babies and mothers were being lost. So he instituted this very practical routine of his team of doctors that worked with him and assistants. When they finished with the autopsies and the dissection, the first thing in the morning, they would wash their hands in a solution of lime and chlorine, Clorox, and that they would simply wash very quickly and go away. He was mocked by every other doctor in the hospital, most of whom were insulted that he would require of them to wash their hands. Yet his mortality rate skyrocketed, uh, or whichever the one would be, where all the other doctors were losing at least one in five mothers and babies in childbirth. He lost one in only 50, and it continued to climb. And so he approached the other doctors, wrote papers about it. I mean, it would be another 30 years before it was taken as common practice. And now as you go through any hospital, they're not only hand washing stations, but sanitation deals and there's creams and soaps and lotions and sprays and whatever. That simple procedure of what washing your hands would do. And it was so powerful, Semmelweis said to the other doctors, I'm not asking you to do anything earth shaking. I'm simply asking you to wash. And I think as we gather at the table, that process of examining our, our hearts and looking inside, that Jesus would say the same thing. I'm not asking you to do anything life transforming because you can't. I've already done it for you. I'm simply asking you to wash. I'm asking you to wash the parts of your heart that have become contaminated. I'm asking you to wash the parts of your life that have become infected by sin again. I'm asking you to wash the parts of your mind that connect you back to places that I've set you free from, that are a trap, 
that the enemy wants to inject disease and death and let it run rampant and you can't stop it. But if you'll let me wash you with the water of my word, if you'll let me cleanse you on the inside, if you'll let me take your minds and redirect them toward things that are pure and lovely and true and a good report, that, that if you'll allow me to transform you and bring you into a place of worship where you worship me with all of your mind, all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength, that's what I desire. And most of us would say, but Lord, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to worship you in that way because of these things in my life. And then Jesus offers the washing that is available to us as we simply look inside and ask his spirit to flow and to wash and to cleanse those things. It doesn't just wash the dirt off. It doesn't just wash the stains away. It purifies. It cleanses. It's better than lime and Clorox, especially if you're my wife and you're allergic to limes. Come on, somebody. That God offers that to us this morning as we come to the table. So I want us to do that. Just as a a, a body, as a unit, I want us to come. And so I just think it's amazing how God orchestrates that, that when I talked this morning and began the message that God doesn't call us to uniformity but to unity. Uh, I don't think we could have come and orchestrated uh, the the events of the service so far, uh, if we would have sit down and planned out, okay, we're going to sing this song and this song and this song, and then Breck, he's going to come and he's going to say these words and we're going to script it all out all the way down. But instead, we let the Spirit of God have the liberty to lead. And it's not a leader, he's the leader. And we're the ones that gather together in his name that the unity that we have isn't something that we've manufactured. It's something that God releases in our life and brings it together because the Lord is one. He's not many. He's one. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect unity. And he desires that as we gather together, we come into that same level of unity because his spirit gives a word. In fact, Paul would go on and teach the Corinthians and say, listen, when you come together as a church, every one of you needs to participate. We all need to enter into worship and and not just sing the same song at the same time, but let the Spirit of God be released from our hearts and our life because it changes the atmosphere, not just in this room, it changes the atmosphere in our cities. It changes the atmosphere in the world. That there are are Muslims having encounters with Jesus, appearing to them saying, I am Esau, their name for Jesus, and I'm the one you've been seeking. And it's happening at profound rates in the Middle East. And I believe the direct result of that is that years ago, we decided to come together as a church and target the area known as the 1040 window. And that there were prayer groups started and and people profiles made and and people did research and and went into those areas. There have been prayer journeys. We've taken prayer journeys here into the 1040 window with college kids simply to go and to pray on site with insight. And I believe God is answering those prayers and moving mightily in that area of the world simply because we targeted it together in unity. But some of those prayers are being prayed from China. Some of those prayers are being prayed from there in the Middle East. Some of the prayers being prayed here. Some of those prayers being prayed in South America in various languages. Some of those prayers being prayed in the spirit because people didn't know how to pray. But God answers prayer. And he's a God of unity that brings his church together. And when we can focus it on that, it'll be like those people gathering together in Omaha, blocking out hate so that people can see one thing, the same thing. And that God blocks out sin and hate and disease and sickness and the things that are blinding us so that our eyes can be open to see who he really is and what he really wants to do. So as we come together this morning, it's not about how many are here, it's not about who's here, it's not even about where we are, it's about what we're focused toward. And as we come to this table, We come to remember him, that it's his body, it's his blood, and it was given and broken for us, poured out for us, that we proclaim his death until he comes. And then 
we come to this place where Jesus invites us to be refreshed, to be washed, to be pure. And as we come to receive, not only can we receive with confidence, but we can minister to others out of the confidence of who he's made us to be. Can you say amen? I want our worship team to come this morning. They're gonna sing a worship song. I want those that are gonna help me serve to come. And uh, Chris, did you wanna share some of the uh, words? Get that microphone. And as we're taking a minute just to look in our heart, obviously the deal is if you've never received the Lord Jesus, he's the one who issues the invitation, whosoever will. It's very simple that you simply not only remember who Jesus was and what he did, but you receive it by faith for you. The scripture says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. It doesn't make sense and it's not fair that you could be able to trade all the sin in your life for all the glory that Jesus has to offer. It's not a get out of jail free card. It's not even a get into heaven free card. It's the fact that Jesus wants to bring us to a father and to connect our hearts with him so that we can know who he created us to be and we can begin to walk in all he created us to do. Can you say amen? So if you've never accepted the Lord, today's your day. It's a great time. Just like Jesus issued an invitation to a table, we invite you to come and receive with us. Just receive Jesus into your heart and pray a simple prayer and ask him to meet you there and then come and receive all that he is. As you remember, as you proclaim that his death is more than enough for you and that his life is working in you even when death tries to come back. That he wants to cleanse your mind and wash you thoroughly and completely and the Lord is there. As we ministered this morning, as Breck uh, shared, and those of you that are waiting on God to answer a prayer, a, a, a petition before him, a, a specific thing, that it's the same thing as we come this morning, I believe it's gonna be our breakthrough. That if we simply respond in, in, by faith in what Jesus encouraged us to do and receive from him, that he's more than enough. So we had several prophetic words that came from the, uh, Saturday morning prayer and then even this morning before service and I want Chris to share those and because I, I believe they're going to trigger faith for some of you uh, in specific areas that God wants to meet you here this morning and then we're going to receive the bread and we're going to receive the cup after everybody has received together and, and that's that's going to be the focal point that that's going to be what we're remembering that's going to be what we're proclaiming that's going to be uh, that time of looking at ourselves and realizing as I receive Christ into me, he's more than enough. Can you say amen? Well, Chris, to share those words with you, and then if you would pray, and uh, we'll distribute the elements. And just take a moment as we worship here after Chris shares this, just to look in your heart, pray a simple prayer, ask the Lord to come in. The power of confession and cleansing is ours in Christ this morning as the Holy Spirit works among us in unity. Amen. Yeah, we just had a few words this morning, a couple words of knowledge and a prophetic word that just came forth. Uh, Ms. Zola had a couple uh, words of knowledge. And really, uh, a, a word of knowledge is like just, you, you might just want to imagine if Jesus was physically here, present, and he was calling your situation, your condition out in this situation, okay? Because it just is... It's not everybody can be healed. Everybody can be healed, but this is just something that God is highlighting this morning, okay? But for men, anyone who is uh, suffering from any type of situation right now with prostate, their prostate for men, uh, if, if you just today, when you're taking the cup and you're taking the bread, just to receive healing into your body for that. And then for women, Miss Zola had one for any woman who's desiring to have a baby, but just haven't had the chance, and just been a struggle. You just couldn't get pregnant. So believe for God to open up the womb. He is still opening up the wombs. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a good thing. And then I just really had a, a, a picture, a prophetic word this morning, and I just saw people who were, were weeping over a, a pile of ashes. And it was the things that the enemy had come into your life and 
you just feel like you have, it's just burn up. There's no life there. There's no hope whatsoever. And, and I just saw you weeping over this pile of ashes and it was gone. But I just felt like the Lord was saying, weep no more. Weep no more. But lift up your head unto him and look at him. And as you look to him, the phoenix shall arise. Going back to an old uh, mythical thing there, but the phoenix, new life. God will bring new life out of that situation as you look to him. The script, scriptural reference there, if you want to jot it down, is Isaiah 61. I think it's either two or three there. But God will bring you beauty for the ashes that has occurred in your life. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you right now for that, Lord. As we just come to the table, we celebrate you. We thank you that you're a miracle worker. You're a life giver. And so, Father, we receive your healing and the new life of God in our lives to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. We've got six stations here, and you are free right now to go ahead and come and partake. And we'll hold and we'll all take together. clean hands and give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to
right there as you sit, would you just give thanks to the Lord for all that he's done for you through his broken body, what it means for yours this morning, one of those prophetic words speaking to an area of healing or sickness in your life, that his broken body is more than enough in which he bore all our sickness and disease, took the sin into himself so that he could take it away on the cross, rise victoriously, having overcome death. Let's thank him as we receive his broken body. Can we raise the cup to the Lord? Can you just give him thanks this morning for a new covenant, a new level of relationship with the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit? eternal one not based on your actions but based on what Christ has done for us and the hope of eternity Christ in us God with gratitude this morning with thanksgiving we receive of your shed blood for us hallelujah now if you would you're able to stand together pastor comes down to the end of the row. I believe they'll collect those from you. When your hands are free, let's just spend a moment worshiping the Lord. You may just want to take a moment to pray for someone around you. Just express all that we have in Christ through that. Father, in Jesus' name, with gratitude this morning, with thanksgiving, with praise, and then, Father, in true worship, in spirit and in truth, we exalt and magnify you this morning. Thank you for all that we have, all that we are. We thank you for the Lord's Supper, for communion. We thank you for the expression of the unity and the diversity of who we are. Father, that we had young and old and families. We had those that were gathered here, Lord God, from different ways, serving in different means, singles, married. God, I thank you that as we come together, that you are the one who brings us into a place of perfect unity. And as we worship you, Father, you connect our hearts and lives together in a profound way. And I pray that the full effect of the life, the death, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ be felt in every one of us today, spirit, soul, and body, in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody who agreed said, amen, amen. Come on, let's worship the Lord we rejoice with one another.